Welcome everybody to uh, what I believe is the 10th online cultural majlis. Um, just checking that everybody can hear me once again, thumbs up if you can hear me. Thank you very much everybody for doing that. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce today's uh, speaker. Uh, Todd, uh, Todd's CV I think speaks for himself, uh, but I, I, am, I am very pleased that uh, this is the, the first talk we, uh, we host with, uh, with one of my colleagues that I've been working with for the past two or three years. Um, but today he will be presenting about uh, research on um, his other expertise, which is the city of Dubai. Uh, a little bit about uh, Todd. Uh, Todd is an architect and writer based in Amsterdam. His work examines the global practice of architecture, specifically how architecture circulates expertise, technologies, and cultural narratives. His upcoming book, uh, Showpiece City, How Architecture Made Dubai, published by Stanford University, explores architecture's purpose to sell Dubai on a global stage, but also to argue for the city's very existence. And I have a little surprise for you is that for the first time ever, Todd will be sharing uh, the, uh, Todd will be sharing the cover of uh, of the book uh, later in the uh, in the presentation uh, for the first time uh, he is also co-editing building sharja uh, an archival investigation into uh, sharja's vanishing modernist landscape more about todd is that uh, todd uh, last year uh, served as uh, the louis khan visiting assistant professor in design at yale school of architecture and as a guest faculty member uh, before that at Harvard Graduate School of Design and for a period of five years starting 2012 uh, Todd was the Rose visiting assistant professor of urban studies at Yale if that's not enough for you Todd even had a career at OMA uh, where he started his uh, I think his um, his journey with um, with the Middle East uh, he he first led the office's entry at the Venice Architectural Biennial 2006 and then edited uh, two journals or two books, Al Manakh One, which is 2007 uh, published, and Manakh Two published in 2010. So we're celebrating the 10th anniversary. And another uh, news piece of news I can uh, share with you is that uh, Todd will now be sharing, I think, uh, uh, specific items from Al Manakh Two starting tomorrow uh, to celebrate the book's 10th anniversary. And both Al Manakh One and Al Manakh Two are uh, explorations of Arab cities in the Gulf region. Additionally, Todd's work has been featured in uh, several Venice architectural biennials the Istanbul Biennial, the Sharjah Biennial 13 publications, including The Guardian, Perspecta, Log, Jadalia, Architectural Design, and Art Forum. There really is so much to say. Uh, the way that this next hour will uh, pan out is that Todd will speak for 20 minutes or so, and then we will have uh, we will have a chance to do a Q&A. Uh, so please uh, write your questions in the Zoom group chat. Please make sure to add your full name and your affiliation, um, and uh, so that I can relay that information to Todd. Todd, you have the uh, you have the mic and you have the screen. You may share your screen. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Sultan, for the invitation to be part of your, your cultural majlis uh, this afternoon. And thank you for everyone for, for being here. I promised Sultan I would keep this uh, brief, which also means that uh, there will be, uh, I'll be going over things rather quickly, but I hope we also do have time to dis discuss things uh, during the, the questions and answers. Uh, I do have slides, uh, and my first one. Um, is a picture of the British architect John Harris in a room with Sheikh Rashid bin Said al Maktoum, who was the ruler of Dubai at the time. This is a picture from 1974. Please share and your screen. Sorry? Please share your screen with us. Oh, I'm not. Okay. Uh, share screen. Host mm. disabled. It says it's host disabled. Oh, I disabled your uh, share screen purposes. Okay. Let's. Uh... Let's go to options. You should be able to do it now. Okay, that's looking better. Disabled still. Yep, I re I re I re re enabled it. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, Paul. great. So I was describing this, not this photograph, this photograph of uh, the British architect John Harris 
uh, in a room with Sheikh Rashid bin Said al Maktoum. And as Sultan mentioned, I've been spending much of my time in the last years looking at uh, Dubai, Dubai's expansion uh, through a historical context, its urban history, really. Uh, but for today, I thought I would share with you more kind of what I've been doing, maybe with you as well, in terms of trying to contextualize what we're all going through. Um, and specifically to look at what, how Dubai uh, is experiencing that. And so for me, it's a big kind of a fluid uh, kind of thinking about it uh, in terms of time, the past, the present, and the future. Uh, and I wanted to start with this image because we often think of architects and we also, also often think of aut autocrats or other political leaders as projecting to us the future. And so we might think that in this posed photograph, these two, an architect and an autocrat, are pointing to the future. But they're actually pointing to the past. They're pointing to a model of uh, what was the first proposal for the World Trade Center. And so I think most of you will know uh, that the World Trade Center includes a skyscraper, the first skyscraper of Dubai, uh, and was once the, the largest uh, the tallest tower, not only in Dubai, but in the larger region. Um, and what you don't know yet about this photograph is that it was actually taken after a meeting in which it was decided that this model needed to be discarded. So that's what I mean, that the, the architect and the ruler are, are pointing to the past of something that was considered too menial, too modest, uh, not something that was going to project Dubai's ambitions at the time. And so this model would go to a, uh, some sort of exhibition in Beijing uh, to profess Dubai's modern, ongoing modernization. Um, and Harris would get on an airplane uh, to go work with the rest of his team in London on a skyscraper proposal. So I wanted to start with that. Um, but I also have another image uh, to share with you um, from a recent uh, posting from Dubai Media Office on its Twitter feed. And I think a lot of us have seen these kinds of images in our social media streaming. Um, and this is one of, uh, I think most of us will recognize, of Sheikh Zayed Road. So this monumental piece of infrastructure going through the city of Dubai. It's a kind of infrastructural spine. It's a transportation spine. It's an organizational spine of the city. And we see a kind of overlaying of, of uh, a kind of a spaghetti network of interchanges and ramps. You see the Dubai Metro as well. And of course, it's kind of uh, memorable uh, towers lining the edges. And so we see it here, the Dubai Media Office has taken this moment to show us literally as, as naked as we can see it, this physical infrastructure um, uh, laid bare with, with, no, with no traffic on it, no automobiles, no humans using it to get from one place to the other. So it's almost this, it's a very rare moment where we can literally behold what the city has created, this kind of this supposed construction of, of, of efficiency or efficiency through the construction of a city. There's something else that I read in this image, which is about political control um, through the government of Dubai. And there are various ways that we could read control in this image, but I want to focus on um, the control of people, uh, the control of that infrastructure. So not only the ability to produce it, but to control who can and cannot use it to the point that it can be literally stripped of use. Um, and what the message seems to be here is that this political power is being wielded for the protection of the city's residents, uh, for the healthcare of the residents, and for the projection, the broadcasting of a hygienic city. I also have another image from uh, the Dubai Media Office, uh, which includes um, a video. So I'll start with that. Thank you. 
So this was a video made by the RTA, which is Dubai's transportation agency, uh, essentially. They control the running of taxis, the running of buses, public transit, Dubai metros, and of course, this road uh, infrastructure of roadways. But what I find important about this, uh, in terms of interpreting this video, is that it's connecting the infrastructure of roadways and the ease of using these roadways to the infrastructure of healthcare. And in between these two infrastructures, we have a rather new kind of infrastructure, the mobile app, uh, which is being run by this kind of interior control center, right? Which is kind of, yeah, it's producing this, this ease, this efficient, even further efficiency of the use of roadways for the residents of Dubai's general health care. What I also see in this is, I think some people will also notice the use of this kind of motivational movie trailer like soundtrack uh, which uh, at least for me reminds me a lot of these uh, development videos uh, for example for Amar or for Dubai properties uh, that is supposed to be emotive to the point where we're buying property uh, but here the the emotion is, is about feeling that we're being taken care of by our heroes who I think it's important to note here is that there's a rather fair um, uh, representation of the kinds of people who are essentially making sure that there is this essential infrastructure. Uh, mainly, uh, a, lots of, uh, of immigrant residents of the city, including South Asians, including Southeast Asians, and especially women. Something else we see in this video is this sign for Rashid Hospital. And we see the interiors of Rashid Hospital, which are again taking care of Dubai's residents. Rashid Hospital was the second hospital designed by John Harris, again, the protagonist of, of my upcoming book. And here's a picture of its exterior, which doesn't come up in the video. And that's probably because it's gone through a horrendous renovation. It's basically been lost to really atrocious uh, reworking. Uh, there's some kind of semblance of these, these domes still here. And I just wanted to comment briefly on these domes, which are part of the design by John Harris, and they really don't serve much of pragmatic purpose. They don't really provide that much shading if you're, for some reason, standing outside of an air-conditioned hospital. But they did provide a symbol. They provided a logo. They provided what one would identify as Dubai Department of Health. Dubai Department of Health was represented by a logo, which was re representing a hospital which was then representing a place, an interior, where one was taken care of. Harris didn't have a lot of money in his budgets to consider the, um, the exteriors of his hospitals, but there was a lot indeed maintained on the interiors of these hospitals. And this was his first architectural project for the city, Al Maktoum Hospital, which was the city's and also the Trucial State's first uh, hospital. And one of the earliest uh, additions that he gave to the hospital was the maternity ward. And my subtitle for the talk today was To Be Born in Dubai, which I think for many people today triggers a conversation about citizenship, about notions of belonging to the city. But in the 50s and 60s, to be born in Dubai really was much more about the capability, the capacity, of the city to accommodate a place of advanced healthcare. Uh, the way to, to let people know who might be moving to the city, whether from South Asia, from India, or from Kuwait or Doha, whose hospitals were also created by John Harris, designed by him, but also residents from Europe and North America, if they could come to a place that could literally take care of you or could literally give birth to a baby. Uh, and these, again, were images that at the time were much more essential than say, showing us images of the outside of, uh, of buildings. The uh, Dubai municipality at the time was of course very much interested in what was happening outside the buildings. But before I get into that, I wanted to show you yet another piece from the uh, Twitter feed of Dubai Media, uh, including a video, uh, which also includes some motivational soundtrack 
that I will spare you of uh, this afternoon. Um, but rest assured, it's much like a movie trailer. Uh, and this um, video is actually addressing the sterilization program, as it was called, that was going on in the older districts of Anaif and Al Ras in Dera in Dubai. And these, again, are some of the oldest uh, neighborhoods of the city, but they are also neighborhoods where some of the city's uh, least paid residents live and work, uh, but especially live. And so we get these kind of images, these performances of sterilization, uh, machines, well-equipped uh, human beings kind of literally dis supposedly disinfecting the services of a city. Um, and while any kind of popular news source will, will give you enough suspicion of whether this kind of use of valuable healthcare money is worth it, uh, instead of giving people, for example, face masks and hand gel, but this, this actual act and in, in, in broadcasting of this image of literally spraying a city is also a certain, not only a performance, but the broadcasting of an image. What I'm left with as a question from this is to whom or for whom was Dubai Media Office projecting this image, uh, which is suggesting that certain parts of the city need this disinfection uh, much more than other parts of the city. I also wanted to make the point that more than 60 years ago, there were similar kinds of spraying going on in the city. And this is an image from the Dubai municipality pamphlet, which was um, showing that yes, the city was spraying against malaria. The British government was spraying against uh, malaria in the 1950s as early. And they also called this act photogenic. So again, we have this connection between the photogenic and the hygienic, that this was an act that needed to be recorded on film on, um, and photographs to show two things. One, that Dubai was healthy, hygienic, and two, that actions were being taken to make it hygienic. And with this pamphlet photo, we see that Dubai municipality has taken over uh, this kind of concern. And this is one of, probably one of the earliest forms of evidence of what was essentially supposed to be a kind of autonomous governing body, autonomous from Dubai's ruling family, autonomous from the British government, still very much active in Dubai's day-to-day um, -day activities. But this pamphlet I found really fascinating is that it's focused on showing that it's taking action, that it's, that it's wants so clearly to show that it's doing something for its citizens and future citizens. And therefore there's this um, um, real effort to show the, the kind of running need to concern, to be concerned with hygiene. Here's an image of some of the first modern architecture uh, to happen in Dubai, essentially public restrooms. So again, here we have a kind of creation of a, a, high, a, a infrastructure of hygiene through the development, production of architecture, but also through the production of hygienic measures. So that these, um, public restrooms coincided with um, some of the earliest public orders in the city, which were basically um, uh, outlawing public urination. Another uh, evidence of hygiene in this early pamphlet um, was wanting to allow readers of this pamphlet, and again, we can discuss who these readers of such a pamphlet might be, but wanting to convince whoever that is, that Dubai is clean, that its streets are clean, that its ports are clean. Um, and what I find interesting here is that we don't see images of these clean streets, uh, but what we see is the, actually the garbage itself that has been extracted from this, the city. And we also, once again, see the action, the, the workers who are actually keeping the city clean. And we see the hierarchy of labor as well. So we see a dumpster truck literally dumping the uh, trash on the outskirts of the city and then it's being shoveled into pits to be lit on fire, ostensibly keeping the city uh, clean, just not its environs. And so, yeah, today I, I wanted to share these, this kind of interlinking uh, between the past and the present. Um, and uh, again, I, oh, I had one more slide about hygiene in the city, historically. Uh, Sultan may, reminded me that this needed to be in this. 
Um, here we have people being vaccinated. Um, a, a, a photo taken from Dubai, one of Dubai's most famous photographers, Ramesh Shukla. And this is an image of a, a British doctor working uh, at Al Maktoum Hospital in the 1960s, and he's vaccinating newcomers. But there's something that this photograph doesn't capture, which I think is really important. Where has Dr. Macaulay set up his little wooden card table to give out vaccinations? It's not in a hospital, it's not in a clinic. What you cannot see, but what I know from papers, is that he's actually at the port, literally at the most active place in the city where not only everyone is coming and going, but where newcomers are arriving in the city on boats. And so literally newcomers are coming and the first thing that they are experiencing is not only vaccination, but this clear visual performance of vaccination happening. So once again, kind of your earliest moment in the city could be this kind of uh, installation of, of health. Uh, so Tom mentioned that my book is about architecture and maybe a lot of these uh, comments aren't so much immediately about architecture, but in, in, in following the work of John Harris and kind of his uh, important pieces, this is the cover of, of my book, which will be out this fall. Um, it was important for me, not so much about the construction of the spaces in which people lived or, or resided or, or worked, but also the construction of the image of the city. And I titled it Showpiece City because showpiece was a term that was used often to describe the projects, not only by Harris, but also important other pieces of infrastructure in the city. And, and you see it being used in newspapers, in the Financial Times, in the London Times, uh, to describe these projects. You almost feel like people are searching for this term icon. But I like showpiece because it has this term show in it. It's about exhibition. It's about showing that the near past, we have these things, we've created these things already, they're there in the present, and show peace signals that things will also be coming in the future, that we have here uh, something that is signaling that other things like this will be coming. And on the cover is the World Trade Center, the construction of it in, in the late 1970s, which of course was called a showpiece, a signpost, a lighthouse, it was a kind of symbol of Dubai's advancement in terms of construction technologies and its levels of comfort for, you know, the traveling businessman. Uh, it was a place of exhibition as well. And this is my last slide, uh, which is about a, a recent set of articles uh, in the UAE about Dubai World Trade Center being converted into a 3000 bed field hospital. Um, this is not part of the building designed by John Harris. The, these, this building was uh, added on much later, but nevertheless, it is still the World Trade Center, and the World Trade Center still captures the spirit behind the original project, namely providing these expansive spaces for exhibition. But when this, these articles started to be out there about the exhibition center being converted into a hospital, I thought it was actually proper to say that this is not a conversion into a hospital, but it's the exhibition of a hospital. So many of you who have been in these spaces for say cityscape or any kind of expo about real estate or kind of promoting some sort of capitalist endeavor, these spaces look very similar to the, the kinds of sp spaces you would find, but now it's about healthcare. It's about providing the space, the technology, the human beings who will be there uh, to take care of you. And while most of these articles would say that there's, um, this might not ever be needed, what is needed is an exhibition that the, this is a city that can accommodate. So I'll leave it there, Sultan, and, and I'm happy to hear from you and, and anyone else about questions at this point. Uh, Todd, would you like to unshare your screen or do you wanna keep it on a, on a specific slide? Uh, thanks for the reminder. Okay, I'll take it off. So, um, thank you, Todd. That's uh, that's really interesting. Uh, I think the first question I'd like to ask you, and by the way, everybody, please type your questions uh, on the group chat so I can uh, channel them to Todd. But the first question I'd like to ask you is, how important was it for these Gulf cities in the 1950s and 60s uh, to place? Uh, how important was placement of these hospitals 
because you spoke about Kuwait and Doha, uh, and I think John Harris was involved in, in a, a couple of these hospitals as well. Uh, where were they located? Were they inside the city? Were they closer to the, to the uh, um, seaside? Were they, uh, and was that important in any way, the placement, physical geographic location of the hospital? Right. I, um, I'm, I'm thinking of the Doha one, the, um, the one in Doha, which is designed by uh, John Harris. I can't so quickly comment on Kuwait, uh, but in terms of the three that I will discuss, uh, the Doha Hospital, Al Maktoum Hospital, Dubai's first, and its second, Rashid Hospital, they were both, all three were happening outside the kind of built, uh, built up city. Uh, and this is namely because they needed the space. Um, the hospital in Doha, the hospital in Kuwait, the hospital, Rashid Hospital, they were all designed with this, the essence of a campus. Uh, they, so this is a kind of clear delineation of a site, uh, a large site uh, that could be expanded after say a first phase. Um, the hospital, for example, Rashid Hospital, it included more than just what we think of a hospital, it included the houses where nursing staff lived and it included the housing where executives and, and, and doctors lived. So you had even hierarchies of housing, apartments, uh, as well as uh, villas. Um, so, and of course, the ever presence of uh, parking. So no, these things are not integrated into existing urban fabric. They're, they're, they've, they've been placed outside the uh, built up city. Um, maybe one other question I have is the use of uh, language in the 1950s, 60s. A lot of uh, residents here of Dubai and the UAE and the Emirates before the UAE, w uh, it, the literacy level wasn't high, so they used a lot of imagery, but then the language was in Arabic. Uh, did you come across any pamphlets uh, that spoke about Dubai's um, healthcare sector in English or any other language? Who do you think these pamphlets were directed towards? Mm. There are, um, when you say pamphlets in terms of hospitals, I think of pamphlets that are actually given uh, out uh, at the opening of these hospitals. So we're not seeing these pamphlets go to, you know, the everyday people on the streets of these cities. We see them going to uh, the, the VIPs who come to the openings. Um, maybe I'm answering your question a little bit to the side, but one thing that I find interesting is, um, before Sheikh Rashid, uh, Sheikh Rashid begins to spend a lot of money on Al Maktoum Hospital, he he has in his um, uh, in his uh, possession the pamphlet from the creation of the Doha Hospital. So even before he meets John Harris, who is the uh, architect of the Doha Hospital, he has the pamphlet. He I don't think he was there, but somehow he has the pamphlet in his hands. And it obviously has uh, an effect on him. One, it gives him more motivation to hire the same architect. But two, it has a kind of indexing, a listing of what a modern advanced care hospital uh, can provide uh, to its users. Um, I don't have anything in terms of how the hospital was being uh, projected to people um, in the city though. And that would be really fascinating. We have a question from Rosie Saad, who says there are significant reminders of New York at the beginning of the 20th century, Ellis Island, the tests, the pictures of construction work and workers, the living neighborhoods of workers, etc. Is this an appeal to all kinds of people to come together to build a city? Yeah, very much. I mean, I think uh, the, the, the pamphlet I was showing from Dubai Municipality, uh, it's in Arabic. Uh, and I think that's an important um, point to make that uh, while I cannot say exactly for whom this pamphlet was being made, I do get the sense from other pamphlets that the city makes that they were being given out uh, to appeal to Arabs uh, to, uh, outside, uh, outside Dubai and most likely outside uh, the Gulf region. Um, there was certainly a sense in the um, 1960s from a lot of people uh, uh, who so let's say the merchants, uh, more kind of the more powerful people of the city, that there was a, a decreasing sense of Arabness, Arab presence in the cities. And so these were being used to, to invite um, more Arabs from outside Dubai to, to move to the city. 
and so yeah, the, the images of construction, but also images of what people might expect from city life were in, in these. You know, you'll even see images of like people water skiing on Dubai Creek uh, in a later one, which I always thought was kind of funny. Um, we have a question from Rashid Al Mulla, uh, Northeastern. Was John Harris inspired by British hospitals when designing Doha, Al Maktoum, or Rashid hospitals in terms of floor pan, plan or architecture? Yes, very much so. Uh, Maktoum Hospital, even more specifically, uh, Maktoum Hospital, uh, there is evidence that um, before anything begins at Al Maktoum Hospital, again, the first hospital, um, do, um, British officials were sharing with him uh, uh, templates, literally called templates for hospitals uh, used throughout the British Empire. Uh, so uh, in colonial states. So essentially, he was using as his model a con colonial template to create uh, Al Maktoum Hospital. We have a question from Umar Islam, who's an urban planner. He asks, did the development of Rashid Hospital or similar developments in Doha, etc., cetera, um, did they lead to the development of a Gulf vernacular for uh, buildings, campuses, etc., that the authorities wanted to use to project a sense of security. Yeah, I mean, I gave the example of the Rashid Hospital, the iconic dome that is later used by the department, uh, especially the, the hospital in Doha. I'm sorry, I haven't shown images of it. Ramala Hospital, as it was called then, was certainly seen as a, um, it was well received in terms of its ability to, what was very popular at the time, to combine modern or, or uh, modernist uh, aesthetics with um, more uh, traditional forms. Uh, so it, it gets a, a lot of credit for that. Uh, it was also a hospital that did not, even though it was a, a rather expensive project, um, it used, um, it used uh, natural air as a means of uh, keeping the air circulation flowing throughout the uh, hospital, not use of natural light uh, was much more present. Rashid Hospital is a completely airtight kind of membrane, uh, keeping the interior away from the outside. So by then that idea is, is beyond what one wants uh, in terms of advanced healthcare. But certainly Harris, you see him involved in, the, I can't say that he gets credit for it, but he's involved in this kind of slow, and we've seen it too, Sultan, in, in, in the Sharjah work, this kind of language developing of arches. You know, we could almost make a kind of lexicon of um, 20th century arches. Uh, Harris is very much involved in those. You see them in the uh, World Trade Center as well. Um, we have a question, uh, Todd. Uh, yes, we do see them. Todd, we have a question from Hitten Samtani, who I believe is based in New York. It says, uh, curious uh, to hear your thoughts on Dubai having to design for a largely transient population. Architects in the region have to grapple with the fact that many of the residents who, whose needs they are catering for aren't, allow, uh, aren't around for too long. Um, I, I, I hear the observation and yes, it's, it's right. Um, I guess, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna maybe answer this diagonally. Uh, one of the curious things I find about Rashid Hospital is that it's this inordinately huge hospital for Dubai. So Al Maktoum Hospital was actually, uh, I can't give you the bed to, to resident ratio, but the bed to resident ratio just with Rashid Hospital is insane. I mean, no other city at that time would, would come near meeting that. Uh, one could read that is that the city was creating itself uh, in order to house a future population. So obviously, if the city is going to grow that much, it's going to be that there's a lot of immigration happening. But I don't know if that's really there. I don't, there's no evidence of, of any kind of clear demographic projections going on that, that you know, Rashid Hospital is going to be required to be there in 7.3 years. Um, what I do see, though, is the kind of creation, you know, much like that World Trade Center exhibition space being transformed into a hospital, it is this kind of 
it's an exhibition in itself that Dubai has this, that it has, you know, an equivalent amount of space that Doha or Kuwait has provided uh, for uh, healthcare. And again, I don't, I don't always like to get into this, oh, Dubai had to have exactly what Doha needed. Uh, it is, I think it's more important to understand it as the projection of an image from Dubai and broadcasting that to whoever will listen. Whoever will listen. Um, Todd, we're probably going to have um, another talk later on uh, to discuss your Dubai book, but there's a question from Beata Stankovic, who's a contemporary dance program, and she says, I would like to know about Todd's interest in Dubai. Uh, she asked, did you grow up in Dubai? What's the, wh what's the source of the interest in Dubai? <laughs> uh, no, I did not grow up in Dubai. Uh, I've spent a lot of my time in the last, yeah, my first time in Dubai was in 2006. Uh, so when we were, I was working on the Venice Biennial. I've always, my time in Dubai is, is kind of equivalent to my time living in, in Amsterdam. Um, it really started how it did with most architects. My job meant that I went there. Uh, I was working for a Dutch architecture firm uh, and it sent me to Dubai. Uh, one thing different about me being sent as an architect at the time is I really wasn't there to find projects or work on architectural projects. I was actually there for, the office actually paid me to be there to learn about the city and to learn, learn about the larger region. And through that, we made the two books, Almanach and Almanach II. Um, yeah, that's, that's really how it started. Uh, and then from there, I, working on the Almanach books, I came across John Harris, and we started to put together the connection between his work on the master plan and the skyscraper, uh, World Trade Center. And when it was time for me to leave, I thought this would be a great project to finish in a year. So 12 years later, I'm finishing the book. So. Um, this isn't a question from the audience, but why did it take 12 years? Well, um, there are very few times when books pay you to, 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 to write them. So, and this is not one of them. The, so I wrote this book in between gigs, uh, in between work projects, in between teaching gigs. Uh, it, um, no one, uh, pays you really to write such a books and I, the advances won't be enough to pay the backlog. Um, so yes, a lot of time that way. But I also think if I had written this book, if this book came out 10 years earlier, it, it, I'd probably be embarrassed about it now. I've learned a lot uh, in 12 years, an immense amount about the city. Uh, but I feel now is the time. So it, I think it did need 12 years. Great, thank you, Todd. Uh, we have an excellent question from uh, Fatima Suedi, who is a student in Masters in Management of Cultural Heritage here in the UAE. Okay. So Fatima Suedi asks, I'd like to know Todd's thoughts on the design of Al Amal Psychiatric Hospital demolished a few years back, in, which was also designed by John Harris and partners, and its similarities with Al Maktoum and the Rashid Hospital. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, what a sad, sad day that that was uh, demolished. There was this wonderful group of young Dubai residents uh, who uh, put together a day, maybe, I don't know, maybe three or four years ago, just before it was demolished. Um, so I do have some very few, I have very few little evidence of that building uh, in the, by the office, but it really was a beautiful building. In fact, I think it, in relationship to the other hospitals, when, I, when they had that public opening day, that was the only day that I've ever seen it. So it was a day these, these young people actually made sure that residents of Dubai could see this hospital. So it was a very special day in that regard. And, and I um, was thankful to be there and thankful to be able to see it. What I would say about that building is that it had a much more integrated um, sense of exterior and interior. There were courtyards. It was very much uh, a kind of, uh, because it was a, I, I presume there were long-term residents in this mental hospital. Um, and so there was this essence of making sure that people had access to, to interior gardens and the like. Uh, so in that way, it was a much better building than Rashid Hospital. Rashid Hospital is this like muscular machine that just you know, lives on air filters and air conditioning. Um, Todd, we have a question from Bilal Qureshi who asks, what were the contemporary architectural influences for John Harris 
in designing for Dubai and the region. He asks if John Harris had any interactions with any of his contemporaries um, that you have come across as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, when I answer a question like this, I usually don't think of you know how John Harris uh, interacted with well-known architects or kind of almost copyrighted theories or techniques. Um, his planning work was very much attached to British New Towns. Uh, he was not a planner. He was not a kind of trained planner, but he had some sort of planning certificate. He went to the Architectural Association in London, which is a very well-known, prestigious uh, place to study architecture in London. Um, his influences, uh, I would say, I, rather than kind of discuss influences, I'll go with the other part of the question, which was what he was picking up on. And part of what he was picking up on was this, uh, you know, his buildings aren't, you know, they aren't the, 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 the subjects of really gorgeous formal photography. Um, he was really much more in line with the production of public institutions. Uh, and there were a lot, there were kind of a, maybe a constellation of, of practitioners out of the UK that were really taking advantage of this impression that the UK was a place, you know, the welfare state. Uh, it was some. It was a concept that could be exported. It was a concept that uh, you could say we know what a what a hospital is that provides for its people. A kind of highly concentrated um, uh, site of healthcare, not dispersed, uh, and that that kind of concentration allows uh, technologies to also to be even more advanced. I thought we have a question from Amal, uh, Amal Anouhi, who says, uh, today we're seeing uh, soccer field stadiums, convention centers uh, being converted uh, for different kinds of use. What does this tell us about designing for the future, especially in the Gulf region? The conversion of stadiums and the conversions of- Convention centers, they're, they're, they're embracing a different uh, form of usage. Does this change architecture and design, especially in light of what's happening nowadays? Uh, I, I can't think of any specific things to, to lean on in answering that question. I guess I would say that convention centers are, are a really kind of awful thing in the sense of how much space uh, they require and kind of the demands ever increasing. And convention centers, whether or not you're in a city in the Gulf or a, you know, a city in the Midwest of the US, um, there is a kind of ongoing insane competition to have the largest, most advanced, uh, the coolest air conditioned space available for all these traveling um, uh, uh, expos and conferences. And I think, yeah, we're kind of staring at a, a bit of a black hole in terms of that right now, right? I mean, the Dubai World Trade Center Exhibition Center is going to be superseded, we think, by whatever is being. Uh, proposed for the Dubai Expo, uh, something you know, many times larger than whatever the World Trade Center has. Mm -hmm. Todd, we have a question from uh, Shamma Al-Bastaki, who is a poet and education specialist. Uh, she says, you use the phrase performance of hygiene and yeah. allude to a sort of health exhibitionism in Dubai. How yeah. do you think the balance tips between spectacle and impact? Mm, yeah. Well, first, I, would, I just want to make clear that when I say performance or the exhibition of, I don't think that's necessarily divorced from a re reality. I don't want to suggest that that necessarily means it's false. Uh, I'm just saying that the, the act, the, the, the performance of it, and I mean the performance of it so that one sees it, uh, the exhibition of it is just as important as the actual provision of it. The, the issue becomes when either of those two things is divorced from what is actually available, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I just think that oftentimes in, in these days, especially when we look at Dubai, we think of, you know, that, that surfaces are lying to us, that surfaces aren't real or they're hiding things, that there's a dark side that we need to, you know, remove the surfaces to find. Uh, my opinion is, is that we need to look at these surfaces and really read them and know what's being said. So that when I say that with that video of spraying all naif, which personally I think sends a very negative uh, image, I want to know to whom is that positive? 
I don't know, but I, that's, a, that's a real question for me. So we have a question from Neda Amagi, who's, who's a senior at NYU Abu Dhabi, who says, what are the aesthetic and practical links between modernist architecture and public health facilities? Why do you think, perhaps aside from architectural trends in the time, that Dubai and Sharjah employed this style so widely for public buildings? She might be alluding to uh, some of the architecture you showed uh, at Dubai Hospital. Right. You know, I think in terms of whether or not there's a style that needs to be there, I think one of the most important things for Al Maktoum Hospital uh, is that one could see, I mean, when Al Maktoum Hospital happened, I mean, you can follow this in the book. There's this like, you know, the whole complicated story and kind of travesty of its funding. Uh, basically, it, it didn't have a lot of funding. But what was needed to happen was that these kind of essentially, these buildings, which were essentially barracks, needed to be presented in a way that one looked at it and thought of, this is a concentrated site of healthcare. And architecture in this sense is not about kind of formal identities or associating kind of with historical developments of forms. It's about providing a, a visual key to people so that they know that this is a place of cleanliness, of healthcare, of where I will get better if I step inside. Uh, I think that was the most important thing that they that, that people looked at these places as a place set apart uh, where they left literally left the built city and arrived into another place that would promise them cure. Um, Todd, we have uh, we have a point from Maryam Al Mazrur who says Naif was not the only area to be uh, sprayed. Um, Simeon right. Kerr from the Financial Times says I guess that these areas were more promoted as being sprayed, perhaps even more performative was the use of drones to, to, to disinfect. Those images were so widely shared and spoke to Dubai's futurism too. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah the drone. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, first, yes, I agree. Yes, I understand that sterilization was happening elsewhere. I think the impact and the amount of it happening in Al Naif and Al Ras was much higher. That's my understanding. I wasn't there. But these are also areas that were closed off so that people living there couldn't leave and people outside couldn't enter them unless they had some sort of pass. So we were forced not to know what was going on. I think that's an important point. But indeed, yes, sterilization program was happening elsewhere. I would argue that it was probably happening a lot more in a concentrated part of Dubai. Uh, indeed, Drones were uh, being a, a, a strong component of this. Uh, and drones were also being used to, to provide those images uh, of the empty Sheikh Zayed Road as well. Uh, we have a question from Antonia Carver, who says, picking up on Mish'al's theme last week, could you comment on the current performative projection of the UAE's identity as multi-ethnic at this time? Antonio's giving me the tough question. <laughs> uh, uh, um, I'm, not, I'm not avoiding the question, but I'm just trying to, to, uh, to, to bring it in kind of what we, we are talking about here. Um, I guess, um, you know, something, you know, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll comment a bit more on the, on the video of the RTA, right? Which I, um, I, I was also wondering to whom that, that video was being uh, projected. Who, who was supposed to watch that and feel the emotiveness from watching with this movie trailer music of our heroes, right? Our heroes are Emiratis, they're South Asians, they're Southeast Asians. They're people filling in different hierarchies of the medical, um, uh, medical staff. Um, so I, you know, I think that's an, a recent uh, trend. Uh, it also reminds me of, I don't know if, how many people have gone up to the near top of the Burj Khalifa as part of the exhibition of its, you know, immense rise from the, from the sands and to the tallest tower of the, of the world. You know, it includes, this exhibition includes kind of portrayal, you know what I'm talking about, Satan, the portrayals of the people who, to, who built this building. So it includes the architects, the engineers, the security guards, 
and the labor force. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of focus on the labor force. But what I find really interesting about this recent video is that it's also showing us this quiet side that we often don't see, which is the, the, the women who are also uh, part of this uh, lower paid uh, segment of Dubai society. I, I thought uh, there was a, a beautiful gesture, I think, or an important gesture at the uh, Jamil Art Center that acknowledged the names of the yeah, uh, workers, yeah. laborers, actually had written their names alongside with all these the elites and the, uh, you know, the, the, the people from the sort of um, all, all different parts of society. It was really moving and I think important to acknowledge the role uh, and the fact that they actually built all this. So that was yeah, yeah. something I'd love to see in different buildings as well. Um, before I direct Reith's comment to you, which is an excellent comment, um, maybe going back to the hospitals, uh, um, Todd, how fast did Dubai recognize the need to build hospitals? So how long did they wait before they commissioned another hospital and a further third hospital? Were, were, the, were the time gaps getting shorter? Were, uh, maybe this gives us an indication of the growth of the democratic in Dubai as well. Yeah, again, it, I, it's at, at least in the 70s, it's divorced from demographics, Sultan. It's, there's just an inordinate number of, of beds being produced in terms of the population of the city. Um, I guess the first thing I'll say is, you know, the they we need to talk about, who's they making hospitals? The first they are British officials, foreign officials, who see, you know, um, hospitals are, are called the medical sphere. And the medical sphere is seen as this apolitical scene where they can win the hearts and minds of Dubai's residents by providing a hospital. They just can't seem to find the few thousand pounds to pay for it uh, at the start. Uh, and very quickly, and it's actually Sharjah before uh, Dubai in the sense, but very quickly, uh, um, leaders in, in the trucial states start to see that hospitals are a component of infrastructure and infrastructure is almost always a very photogenic way of showing advancement and then showing a place as being capable of taking care of people. Um, at the same time that uh, Rashid Hospital was being uh, created, there was also the Iranian hospital going up. Uh, again, not really needed, but Iran is providing money uh, and it's also a very clear indication that money is coming from different places. Uh, and in terms of timing, and in uh, bringing up another brochure, Sultan, there's the, uh, the brochure from the opening of the Rashid Hospital. And the final page announces Dubai's next hospital, which is New Dubai Hospital, now today known as Dubai Hospital in Dara, which is a kind of high rise, also by John Harris. So just at the moment when we see way too many beds in Dubai, there's the announcement of yet another large scale hospital. Um, I have three questions, but I'll begin with Abdullah Shuwaykh, who asks uh, about the journey of writing and the journey of collecting photo documents, uh, photographs for your book. How difficult was it? Can you tell us about the, uh, either the cover photo, he asked about the cover photo, but if you want to talk about the John Harris hospitals as well, since that's the topic of today. Um, sure. How easy, difficult, uh, without giving us all your uh, sources. And uh, all my pain. <laughs> <laughs> how easy was it? Did you Google on the internet and use the images? <laughs> yeah, I mean, first of all, the internet has become much better in 12 years. Uh, and this is something that we talked about, too, at, a, at your recent conference uh, on the Gulf. Um, that in 12 years, there's just been this amazing amount of work being produced on the Gulf. Uh, in terms of urbanism, in terms of uh, architecture, and it's coming from all sides, all sides, historians, anthropologists, uh, architects. And so I've really been able to take advantage of this kind of growing family of, of smart and productive people. Um, and so that's, that has made it easier. But no, a lot of this didn't come on, uh, uh, on the internet. Uh, sometimes uh, using my position as a faculty member, uh, at universities, that is also a really kind of privileged place to be in terms of access mm -hmm. to newspaper archives, all sorts of public documents that are housed in libraries that nobody has ever looked at. Uh, but then suddenly you're the first one to open it in 50 years. Uh, so that's, that's where largely things happen. I also worked with the Harris family. Uh, most of my images, though not the cover image, um, as 
from a really wonderful working relationship uh, with the Harris family who has uh, yeah, just been going through boxes and boxes of stuff to find the right images and documents to help me know the story better. Thank you, Todd. Um, we have a comment from Raith Abdullah, who's a Dubai-based writer. He says, just a thought based on this discussion, maybe for the emerging talents present here, military architecture built in the 80s, 90s would be super interesting to see preserved and repurposed. He says that he lived in some of the old, uh, some of the barracks in the UAE, their, their gorgeous intimate courtyard. Uh, they mimic Al Amal Hospital, the, the, the demolished hospital. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and they're slowly being abandoned, neglected, and discarded. So this is an opportunity for the young researchers who want to spend the next 12 years uh, researching a subject. Uh, we have a question, though, here from Murtaza Vali, uh, who's a New York-based writer. He says, Dubai and Singapore are often spoken of as similar neoliberal urban formations, specifically reliance on migrant manual labor for their constructions. Do you have any sense of comparison of the two cities' responses, especially in how the cities project themselves in images of architecture and infrastructure? I'm thinking specifically in relation to the recent critique being leveled at Singaporeans and the poor uh, uh, conditions uh, of the labor accommodations there. Yeah, there, um, there have also been some uh, new recent reporting on, on how uh, construction workers specifically uh, are being treated right now. Uh, and there are lots of questions. Um, it's also really interesting to watch uh, online. There was a, a really uh, devastating uh, but very helpful uh, article in uh, Mirup, Middle Eastern, Middle East Report uh, by Andrea White, Andrea Wright, um, looking at using her uh, ongoing research on uh, um, laborers in Dubai and kind of what they're going through today. Uh, large questions, you know, the way that labor camps have been produced, I mean, similar to barracks, uh, I think there's a, a fascinating history in terms of where low paid workers, specifically construction workers, are housed in the city. I've written a little bit of, on it uh, before. Um, but in sense, these, these the places where they live are consistently placed further outside of the city uh, to the point that they literally become invisible where they are today. Um, and so it's hard to know what, how those conditions are. So the Financial Times did a report recently that uh, sh uh, talked about how, you know, there will likely be a large exodus of these people once planes are no longer grounded. But then the question becomes, and Andrea Wright begins to pick this up, is what happens to them now? Uh, and that, that is a, a kind of very scary question, especially considering that they're no longer uh, as integrated as they once were. And I'm talking as integrated as 10 years ago, eight years ago in the city. But that's a, a very long conversation to have about why that happened. Uh, and it had certainly to do with an image and who was watching. Uh, Todd, I don't suppose you'd have information about this, but you might have come across um, this issue in your research. Can you speak about the development, Hitten Kumar asks, of the Iranian hospital in Dubai, or maybe other hospitals in Dubai? Yeah, Iranian hospital is really fascinating. Uh, I, I write about it a bit in the book, so I, I don't want to give too much away. Uh, my, what I have about it is from the British Foreign Office uh, uh, perspective. Uh, so, of course, it's very kind of, it's worried about the influence of Iran over British influence, both in terms of political, but also in terms of expertise. You know, the Iranians are bringing over their own um, architects and engineers. They're buying technology. Some technology was coming from the UK, but it was also coming from like Japan and the US. Uh, but they love to use the word lavish to describe the Iranian hospital. It had a VIP space at the time. They're, they were importing not only plants from Iran, but also soil from Iran. They were uh, I've never been to the Iranian hospital. This I actually want. I should try to get in. But apparently, there's some beautiful mosaics on the walls. So yeah, it was described as lavish, uh, which is a very kind of loaded term, I think, uh, from uh, a British foreign official. Uh, Todd, our time has come to an end. Yeah, but, it has. That yeah, was tough. Uh, but I, yeah, so much fun. Thank you. Uh, maybe you one last question. Can you remind us once again? Uh, of uh, your book, when do we expect it to be out? Where is it available? 
Um, yeah. And can we host you for a talk before the, the book is out? Yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to do that. Yeah, the book is, it's, you can pre-order it today. Uh, it's on, um, it will be out, there's a date in October. So uh, we, we were aiming actually to get it out at the same time as Dubai Expo or to get it out in time for Dubai Expo when well, people will be thinking of Dubai and how, what happened to get Dubai Expo where it is. The book has nothing to do with Expo, but again, it's a themes of exhibition are in there. But yes, October it will be out. And I'd love to come back. You hear me talk about it all the time, Sultan. So you're very patient to listen again today. I'm very excited about it, Todd. Thank you so much, Todd, who spoke to us today from uh, Amsterdam. And thank you to 120 people who joined us today. This talk is recorded, will be available for you within the next few hours. Thank you, and I'll see you guys on Wednesday. Have yeah, thank you, everyone, for listening. Huh? Thank you. Bye. Bye.